and now I think a lot of us are sort of facing this period of reconstruction. How do we put things back together? What should they look like um, as we move forward? And so what, what that means for the sort of reset is it's, mean, it's not like a game of chess where someone stopped the game and said, put all the piece back where they started. It's more like someone's abandoned the game midway, shaken up the board, left our pieces in all kinds of weird places, and then gone, there, what are you going to do with that now? Um, and so when, I, when I've been speaking to people over the last few months um, in education, um, in banking, um, in health, uh, in all kinds of different sectors, in church, in the charity sector, um, th the word that keeps coming up is agility. People keep saying we need to have agile leadership. We need to be agile in the way we address this next phase. I, I, and one of the reasons for that, I think, is because people have had really different experiences of lockdown. For, so for some people, sort of lockdown and that this whole period we've been through was almost like pressing a pause button. So it's like a kind of stop. I think that the kind of jokey way I think some of the, the newspapers have referred to that have said, you know, we've baked bread and learned Spanish. You know, that's what the lockdown was for us. Um, and that's been true for some people, but not, not for everybody. I, I think for many people, it, it's almost been a, a period of fast forward where our capacity of what we've got to cope with has really been stretched pretty highly. So particularly if you have people who perhaps work full time or more than full time in the same house, perhaps homeschooling kids all the same time. So it's like demands doubled, tripled, productivity for the workplace went down. Sometimes times with the family were even more difficult. So for some people, it was like a pause. For some people, it was a sort of fast forward. And then I, I, I'm meeting some people who almost like it was almost like an eject button was pressed during lockdown, that, that it was a time of complete disruption and interruption for them. It was a time where they really couldn't cope or they felt really, really lonely um, or, or they, they struggled with real financial difficulty or with mental health problems. And so some people are sort of pausing and some people are fast forwarding and other people are rejecting. And the weird thing for me is it really just depends which hour and which day you asked me which of those I felt it was. It felt like I was dealing with all of those at different times. So, so the, the question comes, what, what do we do with all that? How, how do we take that forward given that the future is always uncertain? So we never quite know what's around the corner. Some people feel like the lockdown was just the prelude to something else, whatever the next challenge is. But you know what? Life's always been like that. Life's always unpredictable in that way. So when I look at this situation, I, I kind of think, what are the opportunities that it, it presents to us? So, so let, let me just kind of give you a few insights, partly from psychology, some of them from the Bible, in terms of how I think we sort of deal with the sort of reentry many of us have been posed with um, at the moment. So the first thing I would say is that I think for a lot of us, we've had moments over the last six months where we've experienced pretty severe negative emotion. So whether it's been anxiety or, or shame or fear or frustration or anger, it, it's, it's been a really difficult time for many of us during that time. And the thing about negative emotion is it's very easy to kind of take a negative emotion and confuse that with our, with our identity. So to end up thinking, this is who I am. I'll never be competent again. I am this powerless. This is me from now on. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that when we feel negative, so any strong negative emotion, it means it makes it means we remember negative things, we interpret the world negative, we predict negative things coming forward, and that sets us right back in thinking this this is just who I am. And so the first thing I would say, I think it's important that we don't confuse how we've been feeling in our darkest moments over the last few months with, with who we are, with, with how we're going forward. Do, do you remember the days when you felt competent? Remember the days when you felt productive? Remember the days when you could relate well to people? Some of those will have been quite recently, but just remember those, pick those up, remember them, recall them. Because so many of our abilities to relate to other people, to be productive in work, to form good relationships, to engage in the things that are meaningful to us, a lot of those skills are what psychologists would call state-based skills, which means that when we feel a bit sad or we feel a bit scared or a bit ashamed, it's almost like they disappear. We, we don't know where they've gone. It, it's like when you're giving a public presentation, let's say, and you get a bit anxious and suddenly your tongue clams up in your mouth and you stutter and you don't know what's going on. It's because in that moment, you've almost lost track of where are my skills? Where have they gone? And for some of us, we, we need to now kind of remember that we may have felt like that at times over the last few months, but all those things, all those gifts, all those good things in you, they're still there. So let's not confuse sometimes our darkest moments with what's going to happen next. 
And that leads immediately into kind of my, my second thing, which be, it's, it's really important to remember who we are. So it's really, really important just to recollect ourselves. So it's really interesting that when you look back through his, Christian history, one of the sort of first spiritual disciplines that St. Augustine recommended was what he called recollection. I mean, he, taught, he, he was talking about memory. But he's saying it's really, really important that we pull ourselves together in one place. And in this case, what I'm talking about is it's really worth remembering the moments, perhaps they were during lockdown, perhaps they were before that, but really dwelling on the moments when you really felt a strong sense of purpose, a strong sense of meaning, a strong sense of I'm in the right place, doing what God wants me to do. And remember perhaps some of the confidence, some of the hope, some of the loving connections with other people that came with that, some of the persistence to follow things through that come with those moments and almost savour and sit with some of those memories, which is a way of sort of reclaiming our identity again, saying you still are that person, even if the context around you, the world seems very different. And that would sort of be my third thing. So, so the first thing is don't confuse the negative times with your identity. Don't make that confusion. Remember who you are, remember what you're carrying. And then, and then thirdly connected to that is focus on your contribution. Um, and, and by that, what I mean is um, St. Francis had this lovely way of talking about vocation. He used to say, you've got a vocation, you've got a calling from God when you have a vision and you have an opportunity. You know, if you know what, you know, you see in heaven what God wants you to do and you have the opportunity to do it, then that's your mission. That's what it means to kind of get on with things. I, and I think what, what's happened for some of us during the period of lockdown is that the things that God has placed in us have remained there but the opportunities to express it might have changed. They've shifted, they've altered, they've been a bit frustrated in some ways. And actually that's not always a bad thing because it kind of gives us a moment to begin to think about what's really in me, what really matters, what am I really about, what, what am I living for? And to also think about what, what we'd like our contribution to be. Because sometimes we find in life that red tape and all kinds of things get in our way and we, we end up doing too much and all kinds of things. And lockdown, in a sense, gives us a chance to really reflect on what am I, what am I called to and what are the strengths, the gifts that God has placed in me that I can meet that with. So some of us are great at caring for people, and that's been frustrated during lockdown. Some of us are really wise, and yet we haven't had a lot of people to share that wisdom with lately. Some of us are supremely hopeful, and actually it's difficult to know how do I express that hope? How do I help people? during this period of time. Some of our greatly disciplined and actually lockdown gives us that period of time where we can use some of those practices, some of those disciplines. So it's focusing on what is it that God has called to you and how can you continue to do that in any circumstance? My, my feeling is that, that that's probably one of the main things we can focus on actually is because we don't quite know what's going to happen next. But I think what we can know is what has God put in your hand? That wherever you are, whether you're online, whether you're sending emails, whether you're on Twitter, whether you can visit people in a socially distanced way with about 4,000 meters between you and them, haven't hugged anyone for about four months, you know, even if that's you, you can still care and you can still love and you can still be available to other people. So there, there would be three of my kind of ways and they've got some good psychological evidence, scientific evidence behind them that I could talk about. We won't go into that now, but it's savoring who you are, saving who you've been, so you remember that. It's um, uh, not confusing who you are with your, not confusing who you are with how you've been feeling sometimes lately, and then also focusing on what are your strengths, what's your gift, what are you giving to the world? And I think if we approach it in that way, it allows us to do two things. So firstly, it, it won't surprise me if for some people the period of lockdown ends up being almost like a period of rebirth. It's almost like a period of hardship and difficulty where, where they almost emerge from lockdown with new things in the hands, a new sense of energy, a new sense of passion for what they're about. And what I, what I find really interesting in scripture when we look at being born again, when we look at the, the notions of being redeemed and being a new creation is how do we interpret that? Because sometimes I think we, we sort of interpret it almost like we've been completely replaced. I was here one minute, I've gone, and there's this completely new thing, and nothing that was there before is there any longer. And neither scripture nor psychology really say that. So if you look at someone like Paul the Apostle, in a sense, his fundamental energy 
to get out there and share things of God remain the same before he was a Christian and after, after he was a Christian. What changed was his orientation and how he implemented those things. So it's not that everything we are disappears and it's completely replaced. Who we are remains. Other people sort of seem to think that rebirth is a bit like a renovation. We're like a kind of dusty, rubbish old house that someone's put a bit of a lick of paint on to hide the cracks and get rid of that. But actually, I think the way God works in us is a bit more fundamental than that. And it wouldn't surprise me if some things really have been shaken apart uh, for us recently. So the way I sort of view this rebirth is it's almost like a recycling. It's like we've been shaken in all kinds of different ways. Some things that were quite important to have us collapsed. And in the place where our old house has used to be, we've built a new one, but actually all the ingredients are taken from the old. It's like a complete recovery of what was there. So the bit in scripture that's really been inspiring me um, through the lockdown that I found really, really comforting is a word that, that actually in the Bible, we only ever find it on, on the lips of Jesus. And it, it's the word that we translate, oh, you of little faith. So that word little faith from Jesus is the word aliopistos. So it's the word faith with little attached to the front of it, small faith. And whenever Jesus says to his disciples, oh, you of little faith, He's always talking about some kind of material situation that was bigger than they were beyond them. So maybe they fed the 5,000 and they didn't get it. Or maybe there was a storm that they were scared of. Or maybe he's saying, don't chase after money because that's not the place to, to go for these things. He says, oh, you of little faith. And what's fascinating about the moment when Jesus says those things is that firstly, I always get the feeling there's a little bit of a twinkle in his eye when he says it. He's like, it's you little faithers again. There you go again. It's almost validating, it's almost empathic. And if he can say that to the first disciples, he can say it to us too. Yeah, your faith went a bit little there, didn't it, at this time? But then what's fascinating is that the next thing is that whenever Jesus says that, the next thing that happens in all those stories, in all those sayings, is that there's an invitation to collaborate with him again. So either he goes on and does something, or he demonstrates something, or he gives a word, or he gives a phrase that comforts and moves us on. And I think when we're beginning to think about this moment of reset, that, that might be a good way to think about it is Jesus comes, he says, I know what you've been through. I know you've been shaken. I know you've been holding on to hope and faith sometimes by your fingernails. But you know what? It's time to collaborate again. It's time to join with me again uh, for us to get together and, and do the next thing, whatever that is. Because it seems to me that when, when we look in scripture, we often don't get a sense that people in the Bible get a roadmap. You know, faith isn't actually about having a map from here to there. It's usually about God guiding us, calling us, leading us step by step, day by day, in all kinds of different ways. And what's certain isn't necessarily the path. What's certain is that the one who's called us is reliable, he's trustworthy, and as long as we're following him, things are going to be okay. So we're going to Pause on some of that and ju just take a moment of reflection. Joy, are you okay for me to go straight into that? Or, yeah, that's good. Okay. So I think if, if we were just going to take two or three minutes to reflect on where we've been and what's going on when we reset, is I think it's worth thinking about what still matters to you even after going through everything we've been through over the six months. What do you still stand for? What's still important to you? Uh, one way of putting it would be say, what, what are you still committed to in spite of the circumstances? Because very often it, it's the core of us that really matters. I, and one of the things that, that I've been noticing in myself and I've been talking to other people and sort of Joy alluded to this as well in her introduction is that for me, this has been a bit of a time of stripping down. It's been quite hard. It's been quite difficult. And yet actually what it's exposed to me is how many things I'd sort of been relying on that when push came to shove, they didn't really matter that much to me. So what are you still committed to in spite of the circumstances? That's one of the things you can kind of just spend a bit of time reflecting on, thinking about, and perhaps thinking about what strength, what contribution do you take forward now from this strange, unprecedented, weird period of time we've been through? Wonderful. Thank you, Roger. And for anyone that's been to a GLX seminar before, we do like to uh, take some time to both interact with one another and with the Holy Spirit. And so I'm just going to, um, as you 
reflect on that before we jump in to speak to Marie Claire I'd just love to give you a few moments um, to ponder on that question maybe get a notebook and just sit there I'll play uh, just a little bit of the new one event album uh, and as I uh, play a bit of the music uh, just invite the Holy Spirit to speak to you what are you still committed to in spite of the circumstances Wonderful. Okay, well, uh, maybe you can take that question away and uh, you could chat to your friends. Um, we'd love to hear any of your thoughts in the comments section as well in the chat. And um, as Marie Claire's speaking now as well, if you've got any um, thoughts on that, uh, feel free. Um, part of the idea of GLX is it's an exchange of ideas. And uh, the idea is that the uh, genius is in the room and it's not just about an expert speaking from the front, uh, but uh, something that provokes um, the kind of image of God in all of us and the kind of creativity of heaven in all of us. So if you've got thoughts um, and uh, even questions, uh, just feel free to pop those um, in the chat. Well, um, the next kind of uh, R that we're looking at, so Roger took us through uh, the reset question and um, the last question that we've talked about on the podcast and that I would love uh, for Marie Claire to speak into is this question about reform and uh, we've been asking people um, about what does it look like to see reformation in society and for the church to bring kingdom transformation and Marie Claire is um, a teacher we were both at university together um, and uh, she went on to be a primary school teacher and then a head teacher and then she took on a couple of other schools that were failing and turned them around and then became an executive head teacher uh, and then became a director of education for a multi academy trust and uh, has uh, a voice into um, the local authority here in Lincolnshire and also um, nationally. She's really inspiring with her work and everything she does. She seeks to bring kingdom values into uh, education and she's such an amazing example of um, someone who uh, is representing Jesus and bringing uh, kingdom change or the kingdom of heaven to earth. And so love you to give uh, Marie Claire Brotherton another virtual clap and we'll welcome her as she speaks to us. Thanks Joy. Um, thank you for that introduction and lovely to see everybody. Um, thank you for the invitation to be part of this. Um, as Joy says, I, I am a teacher at heart first and foremost. Um, 
came into the profession very much with children at the heart of it and young people. And um, I'm now in the position where I get to look after a lot of schools and support leaders in um, doing the best that they can for, for children and young people. Um, and I absolutely love my job. Um, but it's a real privilege to be with you. Um, and as Joy said, this whole topic of reformation and reform. Um, and, and I think if you'd asked me, you know, a year ago or 18 months ago to talk about what I think reformation looks like in society, um, I might have been coming at it with a slightly different um, lens uh, than I'm going to bring today. Uh, and the reason for that is um, in some ways, and, and I, I would imagine others feel like this, we're, we're not out of the woods yet um, around the, the journey that we've been through in this pandemic. Um, you know, we're not together in person, uh, we're not gathering, um, you know, schools are supposed to be going back and um, any of you who've been following the news will see the government uh, announce their uh, plans last night at 9pm for what they think schools need to do next week when we open. Uh, and I just have that sense of, you, you know, we're not there yet. So how do you build a vision for reformation when you're not really sure what the future is going to look like um, and you're not really sure how this is going to pan out for, for us over the next uh, few months and year? Um, one of the statistics that I find really fascinating during the uh, lockdown period was from a survey that YouGov did back in May um, and they, they surveyed people on how they were finding kind of life in lockdown and their reflections and what they found was that only 9% of people in our country wanted life to go back to normal and only 9% of people wanted everything to go back to the way it was before lockdown. And I find that quite an astounding um, heart cry from the nation, really, about the state that, um, that we're in um, and the yearning that comes from that and the, um, the sense of wanting things to be different. Um, and I guess, um, you know, thinking about reformation, that really shines a different lens on what we're talking about, because it's not about necessarily building more, building bigger. It's not necessarily expanding and, and growth in the same way that we've previously imagined. I actually have got a feeling that reformation is actually a much deeper and a much more personal and relational and intimate um, revelation of, of God in our nation um, and through the work that we do. So what I want to share is just a couple of thoughts, a couple of reflections um, from me around what does reformation look like um, in, in our society and where I think we play our part in that. So um, I don't know about you, but one of the things I um, find out about myself fairly early on in life is that New Year's resolutions uh, were not for me. <laughs> I'm not the kind of person who could start off a new year and, and make a list of 27 things I want to change and stick to it. Um, but what I have found in the last few years is that um, uh, if I spend time with God and if I talk to God about what, um, what I'm feeling and what I'm reflecting on, very often he will give me a phrase or a word or very often I'll come up with my own phrase or word and say, this is going to be the year of this. So a few years ago, the phrase was uh, about being passionately patient. Uh, I'm not naturally the most patient person. Um, I'm quite active, quite like to kind of get on and get stuff done. But I felt like God said, no, this is the year where you need to be patient, but you can do it with passion and you can do it with real joy and vigor and energy. Uh, I've also had uh, years where I've had um, phrases like uh, be content with being confined, uh, be content with being boxed in and being a bit fidgety maybe in, in your in your job or in your in your workplace but at the beginning of 2020 uh, in January of this year the phrase was um, be irresistibly hopeful <laughs> um, and that was very much before um, obviously uh, the, the lockdown and, and the things that we've been facing so hope for me has been a really important word for this year and in talking about reformation um, I think hope has got a very significant role to play in that. And one of the um, authors who I, I absolutely love called Margaret Wheatley, she's not, she's not a Christian, but she, she writes the most remarkable uh, reflective poetry and language and pulls together some fantastic things. And the quote that uh, I'm going to read you from her, I think really speaks to where I think uh, I am, but I also feel like as a church and as a, as a group that, that we are around hope and what that means for us. And she writes this, there is a great paradox that points to the hopeful path ahead. It is possible to prepare for the future without knowing what it will be. 
the primary way to prepare for the unknown is to attend to the quality of our relationships, to how well we know one another and trust one another. And I think there's something so beautiful in that around saying, actually, we don't yet know what the future will bring. We don't yet know what reformation in its fullest sense will be. But the way that we can prepare for that is to attend to the quality of our relationships, first and foremost with Father God, but also the relationships that we have with people around us. How well do we know one another and how well do we trust one another? And um, so when we're talking about kind of reformation and our role in society and the workplace and grand visions for, for changing the world, which I, you know, I have an, in a binds, there is something really quite um, grounding around saying, actually, it starts with our core self, our relationship with God and our relationship with those people around us. And if anything, what lockdown has really showed me is that it is actually all about the relationships that we've got with people, the grand plans, the, you know, in our case, you know, uh, educational improvements and you know improving standards and all the kind of stuff all the educational speak stuff it, it came to nothing not because those things aren't important but what, what it boiled down to in the end was how well do we know and trust one another to lead us through something that is completely unknown to all of us um, so the three three things I want to I want to share with you so first of all um, uh, the paradox of hope, um, if you like. Um, and the way that I see this really exemplified beautifully in scripture is a psalm that I've been um, reading actually a couple of times over, over the lockdown period, and that's Psalm 13. Um, it's not the most joyful psalm to start off with. Um, for those of you who know it, it begins with, how long? <laughs> how long are we going to wait? You know, how long is it going to be? Uh, how long will you have your face for me and it starts off in this real cry of yearning for God to turn up and for God to be visible and for God to do something but it finishes only four verses later with this phrase but I trust in your unfailing love my heart rejoices in your salvation I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me and my um my reflection on this psalm has been it's really really easy to just read those last two verses and think oh yeah that sounds brilliant you know we're going to trust in God his unfailing love and we're going to rejoice in his salvation and you know he's been good to me without noticing or really getting to grips with the fact that this psalm was written from a place of saying how long is this going to go on where are you in the midst of this Jesus and the paradox of hope for me um has been the realization that those two things can be held simultaneously in our workplaces in our day-to-day -day. it is it is perfectly normal and in, in many ways um, really helpful to on one hand be saying oh, this isn't the way I want it to be society isn't the way we want it to be yet education is not doing what we want it to do for for our kids um, we're not yet where is God and equally say but we're rejoicing in his salvation uh, he's with us, he's been good to us, uh, his unfailing love is not going to fail us and actually we've got to hold both of those things simultaneously. So when we're thinking about reformation, my, my point is this, that I think we need a reformation of our perspective. It's about changing our perspective to say it's not one or the other, it's both. We can be in the place of saying, how long, God? And at the same time say, God is so good and has unfailing love and his purposes are here and they're with us. And so as we think to the future and we don't know, as I say, we don't know how it's going to pan out for us. I think our role in terms of leading reformation is to be the bridge for the people around us and helping them navigate that. You know, as I've talked to colleagues and, and friends and people going through lockdown, it's been really easy to hear the yearning and the pain and the frustration. And I feel like my role has been to be a bridge and to say, I'm with you and I hear you, but God is good and he's with us too. And our role as the church, in my, from my perspective, is to be the bridge for people so that we can hold both those things in, in um, uh, simultaneously. So a reformation of perspective as we look to the future. Um, se second uh, point for me is uh, around core purpose. Um, and uh, Joy sort of, you know, in the, in the prep for this was saying, you know, can you talk about your, um, you know, how do you bring a kind of vision? How do you bring a sense of, uh, you know, 
uh, reformation and, and transformation. And I absolutely believe that, you know, in my particular role with education, it is about transforming lives. It is about uh, seeing our children and young people, um, you know, really thrive. And I felt, I've always felt that, that I've been called to education for a purpose, but I do really believe that God can give a very specific word to you um around what it is he wants to see in your in your day to day um and for me um uh, this is captured very um powerfully in isaiah 49 and and you know feel free to to read it in your own time but a couple of extracts from that that have really applied to me have been things like this um this is what god i think wants to see in education I form you and use you to reconnect the people with me, to put the land in order, to resettle families on ruined properties. It goes on to talk about there being food stands along the roads and picnics on the hills and nobody hungry and nobody thirsty. Uh, it goes on to talk about here they'll come women carrying little boys in their arms and men carrying little girls on their shoulders. And it says, I'm the one who's on your side, defending your cause and rescuing your children. And I feel like um, in terms of reformation for my own kind of journey in this has been actually let's get back to the really core purpose of what it is we're trying to do um, in society. Um, and interestingly, Isaiah doesn't mention anything about academic standards in English and maths or how many GCSEs our kids get. It talks about uh, being reconnected with God. It talks about them being resettled. It talks about family and food and home and compassion. And actually our role um, in, in education and our role as, as the church is much broader than sometimes the labels that get put on us by sometimes the government and sometimes the media about what our role in society is. And um, so my second point really about kind of um, uh, reformation is actually asking God to reveal to you uh, the core purpose of your work again and to maybe take off some of the labels that have been put on your on your day to day and ask God for a real insight into what's his heart um, for your sphere, what's his heart for um, for what you're doing. Um, and then the, and the final final point I want to make is um, in terms of reformation is actually about partnership um, and um, and how we do this together. I think very naively, probably 10, 15 years ago, I might have thought that I had a bit of a, um, a, 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 a that I was the only person who had a, a sort of vision for education, right? You know, it's all, I have, I have a sense of what God wants to do and, and in my workplace and that I was probably a little bit blind to all of the other people around me um, who also have a sense of calling to their workplace. And GLX has been brilliant for putting people in the room together and, and getting people to really listen to those around us and to understand how God is moving and working in the church. Um, but actually, um, what I've discovered over time is that it's, it's not just about kind of my workplace, it's also about how do we open doors and partner with one another to enable each other to serve and enable one another to find um, vision and hope in our workplace. Um, and just a couple of things on this really. Um, one is that um, recently I felt like God's been really speaking to me about the people around me who enable me to do what I do um, and who have a ministry to me in, in my role and, and Roger and, and my kids are brilliant and I've got some great friends but I want to tell you about my, my housekeeper Ruth. Uh, I have this wonderful, wonderful, godly lady who comes and serves us in the home and, and, and does our laundry and cleans up after us and, and really enables me to, to do my job. But one of the things that I, that I absolutely love about her is that she sees her job and her role in our home as her ministry and her calling. So she absolutely believes that when she comes to clean our house and, um, and look after us, that she is working with God and partnering with God in what he's doing in the world. And she gets great pleasure out of hearing what we're doing in our, in our, our workplace. And, and very often I meet her at the door and she'll ask me how things are. And I'll tell her that I've had a drama with this school or I'm a bit worried about that. And she'll pop off to get the Hoover and shouting, well, I'll pray about that. And off she'll go and, and come back and let me know uh, what she's been praying and, and uh, what she's been thinking about as she serves us. And I think um, one of the things that I wanted to kind of uh, to point out really and share is that actually how we enable one another, how we open doors for one another is really, really important in the church. It's not just about um, kind of looking at those people who've got big job titles or who sound like they're really important, that actually we've all got a role to play in being um, 
and door openers for, for those around us. Um, so who is it that we are opening doors for? Who is it that we're serving? Who is it that we are um, listening to and opening our hearts to as we partner and think about reformation? And I think the biggest thing for me over the course of uh, the last six months about thinking about the future is, actually it's all about the people that we're doing this with it's all about the partners that we're going you know we're doing this journey with it's all about finding jesus in unusual places uh, finding that he's at work in places where we didn't know that he was busy doing things and actually really connecting with people so the the third point is really actually seeing a reformation in the way that we partner together and the way that we connect with one another in the church uh, and so my kind of reflection on, on that is really just to think about actually who's in this with us who is it that is opening doors for us? Who is it that's enabling us? Who is it that's uh, connected uh, with us and who can share in the joy of what we're doing? So uh, in, in kind of summary, and then I'll, I'll hand back to Joy to, to uh, take us into the next section uh, in summary i guess it's about changing our perspective so having a reformation in our perspective that it is okay to cry how long lord <laughs> and simultaneously proclaim hope and proclaim and um, goodness um, but also to um, find a reformation in our purpose so ask god to reveal to us what's the core purpose of, of every endeavor that we are putting our hand to and finally who's in it with us who are we partnering with um, and the final thing just to share before, before we hand over is, um, and I've stolen this from, from somebody else, but it's a really lovely um, example of what hope can be like. So hopeful people um, believe four things. They believe firstly that there is a better future out there, that there is something brilliant to pursue, something great for us to work towards. Secondly, that we've got an active contribution to make in that that we can partner in that we've got a role to play in getting us from a to b around that future thirdly that there are multiple different ways for us to get there there are lots of opportunities lots of different ways this might work out it's not just one path there are multiple paths and finally there will be challenges there will be obstacles but we will be able to overcome those so hopeful people believe there is a better future We've got a contribution that we can make in our day to day, that there are multiple ways of us making a difference and that although there will be challenges, there are ways to overcome it. And I think for me, that's what Reformation is about. It's about being the bridge for people and holding hope, turning up and bringing hope um, into, into people's lives. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you, Marie Claire. That was really good. Uh, loads of food for thought. And in a minute, Lauren's going to put the questions that you um, said into the chat so that we can uh, see. Now, the ethos of GLX is connection and uh, sharing ideas. And so I know some people feel a bit uncomfortable about this, but we're going to get into um, some breakout rooms and we're going to ask those questions. This is the opportunity for treasure because we get to share and connect with other people. And I would love you to think about your sphere that you represent. And so as you introduce yourself uh, to people, um, you can say where you work and where God's called you to and then uh, discuss these questions. Before we do that, I'd just like to invite you to a couple of other things that we run as GLX every every month um, one Friday uh, tea time in the month we run a virtual drinks uh, GLX drinks and that's an opportunity for people to come into a room like this and to just share what God's doing in their life and in their workplace while we have a bit of a drink to unwind at the end of the working week uh, I'd love to invite you to that and the next one is the 4th of September and um, the kind of link will come in the chat for that and then just also a safer date for our next glx gathering is the 28th of november 2020 the likelihood is it will be a virtual gathering not in person but we will have uh, a really brilliant program lined up for you with some kingdom advances and influences uh, to inspire you and an opportunity to exchange ideas so let's go into uh, the uh, breakout rooms uh, we've got kind of 10 minutes to chat introduce yourself discuss some of these ideas, pray for each other before we come back to end the seminar. Thank you so much. How are we getting on, Lauren? 
Yeah, everyone's just going into their rooms now. So it should come up on everyone's screen and then they'll just uh, need to press join. Okay, there's um, about nine people left on the main screen that don't appear to be in a group. Is that just like a timing thing? Um, yeah, it should be. Okay, let me... Should we do a group here? Yeah, we, yeah, let's do a group. About. Let's be in a group. There's a few more of us than I thought, but um, why don't we um, just introduce yourself. So we'll go around on the screen. I'll see if I can kind of facilitate it a little bit. Um, and just um, if you introduce yourself. So Richard, if you go first and just give us like really not very long because we've only got 10 minutes, but just hello, who you are, kind of wh where you're calling from. Okay, can you hear? Yeah. Hi, I'm Richard Stevens. I'm the UK Chairman of Kairos Prison Ministry. We work in prisons up and down the A1 from York to Huntingdon. And normally we go in with a team of about 20 uh, volunteers for five days to spend in the time with the men of equal number, uh, giving them for the first time a, the identity of themselves, not as, as criminals, but as uh, potential Christians. Wow. Uh, that's about now, but that's what we do. That's great. Great, Nikki, do you want to go next? <laughs> Hello, Jai. <laughs> nice Hi. to see you. Um, yes, um, I'm Nikki Walker. Um, I work for myself. Um, I run um, something called Restoring Eden. Um, I uh, design gardens, work with people in their gardens. Um, yeah, they always work with me, not for me. Um, Yes, had some very interesting experiences through all of this as well. So, and I'm part of Threshold. Wonderful. Kevin? Um, can you hear me? Yeah. You can, because I've been having trouble with the, mic the microphone. Um, yeah, my name is Kevin Nichols um, from Rumford in Essex. Um, I'm currently sort of like semi self employed. I've took early time and doing a little bit of admin work for a couple of local char charities. Um, at the moment, sort of looking to sort of like group of us move a group of it from the church from a building into our community so going following god into our community that's what we're looking at doing great great sally hi um i'm a solicitor specialized in family law and um i well i used to do that before and i had like a six month um six year career break where i worked in the local school so i'm really enjoying going back into law and it's yeah it's quite interesting yeah wonderful angela well, hi, I'm Angela Johnson Katja. I do live in the UK, even though I'm from America, um, and I work in the healthcare at the minute. So in the community pharmacy, but also as a bank uh, admin for our local um, NHS partnership, Mental Health Trust. Great, great. And the other Angela. <laughs> hi. Um, yeah, I don't do a lot at the moment. <laughs> I head up the prayer team, but um, alive I can. <laughs> right. Okay, well, let's just do a jump in because not everyone will have time to talk, but um, let's talk about highlights. Um, the questions are, what's your core purpose of your work? And um, what ways can you bring hope? Who's in, in this with you? And who opens doors for you? Who do you enable? So we won't get through all those questions at all. and probably won't get to hear from everyone, but um, who wants to jump in? Maybe if I actually pick. So um, Angela with the American accent, do you want to like uh, tell us a bit about your work and some of that? Uh, that would be great. Um, yeah, thanks very much. Uh, I guess from where I am, because working in the NHS, obviously I've got confidentiality rules and things that I have to uh, abide by. So I thought, well, Lord, you seem to be placing me in healthcare. What is it that I can do? And so through that, I've just found that a lot of praying for people. Um, you know, obviously I try to push the envelope as much as I can uh, to share the gospel, to let people know that I am that link with Christ, you know, oh, in church on Sunday and yes, I'll pray for you <laughs> and that sort of thing. And lately, I found that the Lord has been placing people on my heart, people that I see in the pharmacy setting 
on a regular basis and just really have an opportunity to pray because obviously some of them, you know, will be hooked on drugs and they'll be doing the methadone. And for some of them, I've known a couple of years and I've not seen any difference. And I just feel like it's time to really pray and sow uh, the Lord's purposes into their lives. So it seems at the moment that's where I'm meant to bloom, you know, where I'm planted and just be able to lift these people to the Lord and, you know, fast for them, pray for them. And I would love to see some fruit from that. Oh man, that's amazing. Well, we're praying for you. Pray that uh, yeah. all those dreams that God's planted in your heart uh, come to fruition. That's Thank you. Cool. Bless you. Sally, what about you um, and your uh, kind of work as a solicitor? Um, for me, I guess it's kind of hard because um, I've been married 20 years and during that time, me and my husband have really worked for our marriage and um, we just recently done a course and um, it really helped us because, you know, you kind of you know, you have to go up and down. So it's quite sad that in these cases, people have made the decision that their marriage is at an end. However, I do um, follow the resolution code of practice to make sure that I that the um, dispute or the dif difficulties they have are managed in a way that um, helps them move forward in the future. Doesn't make things worse for the children either. And I've also noted as well when they need counselling, when they find it hard to make decisions. So I've taken that on board and given them breathing space um, to come to it. And if they seriously just want to ring up, yell at me for a bit, that's absolutely fine. Just just let them and then I'll then they'll come back and like give their instructions. Mm -hmm. Right. Amen. Yeah, that's great. Has anyone got um a quick story about the kind of who opens doors for you or who do you enable? Bearing in mind what MC said about her cleaner. Um I've got an unusual yeah, I, I'm having all sorts of strange occurrences. Um and everyone is now a gardener. Um <laughs> So I have been incredibly busy. Um, but I, one story I want to tell you about an unusual enabler um, is a client, I've got a client who I've been going to and working with for a, for a long time. We've done a garden from scratch and I go regularly. She runs her own hairdressing business and she's completely frazzled most of the time. Um, I saw her at the end of lockdown and uh, she was looking so much better because she hadn't been working and, and you know we, we get to talk and we get to talk about Christian things uh, and she um, I've prayed a couple of times for her um, and and that's as far as it went recently I get a text from her um, I was doing somebody's hair Nikki and um, I got this strange feeling that you needed to speak to her so I said, okay, that's fine. Um, in the meantime, I've asked for some help. I've asked the Lord for some help because I've got so much work on. I don't quite know what to do. Um, and so uh, I spoke to this lady who is very, um, oh, she's into yoga. She's into the earth. She's traveled a lot. She's kind of an earth mother kind of thing. Um, but we had an affinity on why why I work and why I do what I do because I don't charge a great deal for what I do because it's all about the people and the environment and yeah so we had this affinity so I, I met this lady um, she started working for me which is um, or with me which is, is really good and we've we've had lots of sort of instances for conversation um, but I text back to Michelle and said um, thank you for that um it just can you still hear me yeah, yeah it just appears that um the um that this was meant to be and i'd been praying about it um and she said well i just had the strangest feeling and i said well that will be the holy spirit you ought to listen to it more often and kind of that's where we left it so um yeah that was a real strange occurrence Wonderful. Sorry to take so long. I oh, know, that's great. Thank you, Nikki. Well, I hope you all had um, a great chat with your uh, groups. There's never enough time uh, to do what we want to do, but we want to honour the time of the seminar, and uh, we said we'd finish at three o'clock. Uh, with GLX, we usually have like, quite a lot of time to kind of... Um, Fill, uh, flow out and just have a coffee and a chat and so I uh, just encourage you to engage with our community and you can do that online um, through the GLX podcast the exchange through all the GLX social media uh, you can do it on the Facebook page we've got some sphere groups 
and also we would love to invite you to Friday Drinks, which is another kind of hour of chat about our work, our purpose, our calling and advancing the kingdom everywhere. Mm -hmm. I'd love to say a really big thank you to Roger and Marie Claire. Thanks for everything you've shared. Why don't we show them some love? Yeah. That's great. And feel free, we're not going to close this down, but if the, real, the program kind of is carrying on for one event, so feel free to log off now and you can go or you can stick around and chat to each other, unmute mics, have a bit of a frenzy of like chats, that's fine. But uh, praying for you as you go, as September starts, as after Bank Holiday Monday, uh, you take what God's put in your hand and you, with faithfulness and partnership with him you advance the kingdom where he's placed you and i love what all of you do keep sharing your stories it's really inspirational to see thanks everyone thank you thank, thank you. you bye here's joy bye. God bless. okay Feel free to unmute yourself to say hello. Unmute. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. She's gone. Hi. She's gone. <laughs> Hi. There we are. Anybody thinking you'd like to come to prison? Roger. Hello. Uh, oh, there's Rob too. I didn't recognise you without your glasses on, Bob. <laughs> There she is. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Roger. Hi, Roger. Hi. Hi, Tim. Thank you. Thank you for the um ah, the birthday card the other day. That's all right. <laughs> Hi, Dot. Hi, Jean. Hi, Tim. <laughs> Do we let people into the secret? <laughs> Rod Roger and Marie Claire. Roger's our nephew, and Dot is our uh, I'm I'm Dot's sister. So uh, we love a family reunion. Family. A family, family reunion. Yeah, <laughs> couldn't resist it. <laughs> we're glad we're here. Where are the boys then? Uh, entertaining themselves somewhere. I think they're on. They're on their <laughs> Xbox or. Yeah, very good. Anyway, we've. I'm afraid we've got to go. So we'll say goodbye. Bye. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Dot. Yeah. Thank Speak you. Speak tomorrow. Bye. Speak tomorrow. Bye. 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 Bye